morning, everybody. I'm Claire Delongeau, the IVE event director at Museum Connection. Thank you very much for joining us today for this inspiration conference. Today's conference will feature on local tourism and how innovation can encourage it. I'm very happy to welcome Julia Luc Zach Rougeau, editor in chief at Tom Travel, who will moderate our debate, and Mary Hobson from the National History Museum of London, and Cyril Siama, Musée des Impressionnistes de Giverny. Before starting, I have a few technical information to share with you. We'll spend 40 minutes together debating. Uh, you can ask your question in the chat. And if you have special question for our participant, uh, you will be invited to, to join special room, dedicated rooms at the end of the conference um, to ask your question to the speakers. Uh, and now let's start. Julia, over to you. Thank you, Claire. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us in this uh, special session for Museum Connections. So I'm Julia luxac rougeau and I'm the editor-in-chief of uh, Tom Travel, uh, which is a, a webzine uh, which deals with innovation and digital, digital transformation within the travel and the cultural industries. Uh, so today, yeah, we are going to talk about uh, innovative ways to encourage uh, local tourism. As you know, uh, the pandemic had and still has um, an important impact on these two industries. Uh, as we can't travel and move as a usual, uh, there, has, there, has, there has been a, a shift in the way we discover uh, our neighborhood, uh, in the way we interact with uh, shopkeepers, uh, associations, cultural places. So yeah, in a in a in a nutshell, uh, staycation staycation is king right now. Uh, in this context, uh, cultural and uh, travel institution have to be more uh, united uh, than ever uh, in order to survive, but also to attract people. Uh, we didn't uh, especially pay attention how neighbors. Uh, to talk about this subject, so uh, we have uh, with us uh, Mary Absen, uh, Odeon Research and Insight Manager at Natural History Museum of London, and Cyril Siama, Director of Musée des Impressionnismes. So let's begin. Uh, let's begin with you, Mary. I have a question for you to begin. Um, did you feel uh, a new interest from local people to come visit your museum uh, during the pandemic? Yes, so traditionally at the Natural History Museum, around 71% um, of our visitation has been from international visitors. We've had a very small proportion of visitors from London. However, in the pandemic, this has completely changed. And in the last year, we only had 2% of our visitors being from overseas, with the vast majority coming from our London neighbours. And what about now, see the reopen in May? So we've only opened for a short while and yes, similar trends um, have been um, experienced. We've made a kind of a real dedicated campaign to try and attract our local audiences um, in ways than perhaps we haven't before. Um, we've done, we're part of a local government initiative called Let's Do London. That's a mayor of London have partnered with London and partners and various visitor attractions to try and um, tempt Londoners back to tourist destinations. And um, there is a video of our museum as part of that campaign. So we're really trying to attract our London audiences and we're telling them, you know, this is your time to visit. We are quieter than normal. We don't have the, the tourists, we don't have the school groups. So this is actually a really great time to come to our museum where it's a little bit quieter and um, have the galleries a bit more to yourselves. It's a lovely time to come and experience um, our great site. And you told me that uh, your neighbor is a, a touristic one. Right, so um, we're also part of Discover South Kensington, which is an organization that conducts market research and advocacy to help improve 
um, the South Kensington neighbourhood that we're a part of, along with the B&A, the Science Museum and other major attractions like the Royal Albert Hall. They conducted some perceptions research prior to COVID-19, which discovered that um, people in London, particularly in our local boroughs, perceive South Kensington as a really touristic destination and one that they potentially uh, would avoid because of it. Um, it's perceived as for tourists, it's perceived as um, expensive, it's perceived um, as busy. So what we've seen recently prior to COVID was that Londoners would tend to go to tourist sites in their much more localised area. Um, and there was a trend of visitor numbers from Londoners to national sites decreasing. And it was because people would seek out their local area, even if they had friends and family visiting from overseas, they would tend to visit sites that were off the traditional tourist trail. So this, this problem in a way of decreasing numbers um, has been something we've experienced pre-COVID, but we actually think COVID could be an opportunity to attract back those local London audiences. And that does seem to be um, the case. And we'll talk about uh, how you attract these uh, these people just after. But uh, now, Cyril, uh, I think for you, the typology of your visitors uh, didn't change that much. No, it didn't change that much. In Giverny, um, usually there's only around 30% of our visitors are from abroad. And now it's around maybe 10%. And we think it will be very difficult to, to get this uh, public back. So we have a lot of local visitors, but you know, Giverny is very close to Paris, uh, 70 kilometers, less than one hour. So it's like a big, lovely suburb for the Parisian people. So we have a lot of Parisian people coming here for have um, a break uh, after the lockdown, because we have wonderful gardens. And what is uh, very important for Giverny, is, of course, is a uh, Monet's house and the, the house of Monet is very attractive, but we have to say that with the reopening in the middle of May, there's not a lot of people because people are, are coming to Giverny for an experience. And when you don't have a sunny day, uh, they don't come. So they're coming for the exhibition in the museum with impressionism. They're coming for an experience in the garden of Monet. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of uh, French people coming here and not so many tourists. And in our museum, uh, traditionally, we have only 1% of Asian people, Japanese, Chinese, Korean. Uh, the, the people from abroad came from USA, England, uh, a lot of uh, Spanish people, Italian people, German people. So these people will come back, maybe not the American one, now, but we, we are hearing again uh, English in the streets, which, which is lovely, but um, we have a lot of uh, French people indeed. Okay, and so Mary, did you change, uh, you talked about it uh, just before, did you change the, the way you communicate, the way you promote yourself, your museum, to attract uh, these uh, local people? Yes, yeah, so um, we've um, changed our sort of uh, the way that we interact with our local community we've been much more proactive in the last year we've appointed a communities partnerships manager um, who will his his role is to establish relationships with local community organizations um, in the last year we've gone out to the community and we've done things like um, put activities into food banks we've um, done specific community openings to invite local community organisations into the museum at particular time slots where they'll have goodie bags and be warmly welcomed. And we want to expand that into a full programme of activity when COVID allows. Um, so we've sort of done a combination of trying to invite the local community into our site with the community openings, but also going out into the community and meeting the community where they are and inputting our offer. So like I say, with the food banks, we've also gone to community open days, perhaps in local gardens, for example, and helped run activities there. So we're trying to really create a better um, dialogue with our communities. And over the summer, we want to do some community consultation to really understand more 
from our local communities about what role we can play in their local area. Um, that's not necessarily just in terms of them visiting us on site, but again, what can we offer the local community um, and really coming at it from their needs and thinking about how we can fulfill those. So we've done a lot of um, work to communicate, I guess, more um, with our local communities. Yeah, with a social goal, you told me. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. We're focusing in, in um, our local communities. We've got areas of, um, of um, communities who come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, for example, or from racially minoritized backgrounds. And we're particularly targeting those groups because they tend to be underrepresented in our audience demographic traditionally. So we think this is a great opportunity to um, try and address that actually, but doing it from the, their perspective and um, not making any kind of assumptions about what they might need from us. And through that consult consultation work, we hope to understand and um, develop our community offer beyond COVID. And as you said, this is uh, the time to for us mm. to to come and visit and be and be free to to be uh, to to see uh, to great thing uh, at the museum uh, that they they, they didn't uh, before. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. Cyril, uh, you did something interesting in your museum. You have made the entrance free uh, for all inhabitants of uh, Giverny. Uh, yeah, can you tell us uh, more about it and uh, tell us uh, what events and activities do you organize to to make the museum uh, more attractive uh, to be to, to make the museum more um, than a museum in a way? We had two decisions. We, we decided to, to let the ticket free for young people until 18 years old for exhibition and uh, collection. Such so is important and for Giverny, for all the habitants of Giverny. It's not so much, it's five, 500 people in Giverny, so it's less than 1,000 people. So, but the, the, the issue is that the people from Giverny don't go to the museum because they are working in Paris, they're coming back to the house uh, and for the weekend, they're making some shopping. And this is what you say, Julia, I, I would like to make this museum a kind of house of happiness. I don't know if I can say that, but where you can have a, a restaurant, a shop, an event, an exhibition, a garden, and to see the building which is very lovely. Uh, if you know the Fondation Bayella, Bayella Foundation in, in Basel, Basel uh, it is the same kind of arch architecture with wood and glass uh, when, and it's inscribed in the, in the hill of, the, of, of, the, of Giverny. So you cannot see the museum. Uh, it's really like a garden. So we are organizing events for people from Giverny. Tomorrow it's a festival of, of music, of piano. Uh, in the middle of July, there is a baroque uh, music with the, Les Arts Florissants. Uh, but we made also electro uh, electronic uh, evening uh, in September, and we make some dance for the young people. With you have uh, uh, the earphones, and you can you can dance with uh, what the people ask you to, to do. It's very participative, and uh, we like make a we, we we did also we will we'll do it again um, a festival of movies of of, of cinema. Uh, just to have an offer for the local people, they can ha cannot go to Paris, they don't have the, the way to go, it's, it's expensive, and say, so, no, this museum, it's a very important museum indeed in Normandy, there's a lot of people, and we, have, we are lucky to have the opportunity to make it, and I think it's important to give to, to uh, what, you, what we received, and uh, for a museum, it's an exchange between local people and what we can offer. So you have to, to imagine what you can do after the COVID. I think the big exhibitions with uh, um, always the Monet or Van Gogh or Gauguin, it's really over. Nobody can offer it nowadays. So you have to uh, imagine other opportunities for people that they cannot guess to, to get in, in a small village as Giverny, you know, it's in, in Giverny, it's very lovely during summer and spring, but during fall and winter, it's foggy, it's rainy, it's snowy, there's nobody, everything is closed except the museum. So you have to all be a, a center of offers. And with the restaurant, you can have 
uh, take a coffee or and it's important for us to, to be a center of uh, of social um, community and you told me that you 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 listened to to these uh, local uh, community to uh, organize activities you told me something with uh, uh, children and uh, something with um, strollers something like that yeah yeah we, we made something quite special uh, because i think it's important to to have very young visitors and to attract them we we made um, an opening for a vip opening for the young young uh, people what what i mean is that i made the visit as a deal for minister or for an ambassador and uh, we have uh, three paintings to see they have some games they have some goodies and after that we have a, a reception for them and the parents were outside we didn't want to be with the children because it's as always a confusion if they were too young they, okay i want my dad okay but uh, it was very uh, very free and the people were surprised that the director came to to speak to young people for five to seven years old because uh, they think we are very important and the museum it's impressive for local people they say not it's not impressive it's your museum and come to with your children so next time we do what all the american museum do we will make something for the very very young um, children you can go with uh, with your dad your mom and the museum will be for only people from to one one day to three or four years old so they can have the museum for them and the local people the the senior will come after that, maybe at 11 o'clock. We will change the hour of opening so that uh, the mom and the dads can, can go freely with their, with their children. Because usually it's impressive. And we, when you have a, a young, a young ch children, you cannot be free to visit. You have to, to go to the toilets. You have to change your, your, your children. So it will be an, another experience. Great. Uh, Mary, are you in the same state of mind? Do you want to be more than a museum? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is where the community asset mapping that we're about to commence really comes in. So, you know, traditionally, I think when museums uh, work with local communities, it's about increasing visitation on site. Whereas we in our work, we want to understand what is it like to live in the local area? what is um what do they have in terms of provision for leisure activities science activities nature activities and where are those gaps and then really working with community leaders to understand how the museum could fulfill those gaps whether it's something like um providing just a room for communities to meet in or whether it's about us going out into community gardens and helping with some planting and providing advice um so we're really trying to think about it from not we as a museum, what we want to do, as it were, to the community. It's what the community needs from us and really trying to think um, more broadly um, about that, about, about what that could be. And this is where um, we're going to work with these community gatekeepers to understand the needs of the community. We're going to survey our local communities and we're going to work with the community gatekeepers to sort of heads of organisations, basically, to interpret the survey findings and think about next steps and actions. And we want to share the survey findings with the communities themselves so that other groups can benefit and, um, and learn from what we find out. So yeah, that's our, our kind of new approach for this year. Yeah, so let's talk about it. You, you work with other cultural places uh, in the neighborhood. Can you tell, uh, tell us more about it? Yes, yeah, so um, we work um, in, in two ways really with our local um, sort of uh, partner, um, institutions. So firstly, I've, I mentioned Discover South Kensington, and that's a collective of all of the cultural institutions along the Exhibition Road um, that have been established. And we work together to commission audience research, to share findings, and to put on community events as well. Um, we're also part of the National London Bench Benchmarking Group, and that's where we work with other national museums to share our annual exit survey. So all of the London nationals or the vast majority of them, we have a very similar exit survey. So we're asking the same questions of our visitors who come to our sites as they leave. 
around their demographics, their motivations, their behaviors, and so on. And we do that collectively so we can benchmark and share our data. So we can understand our audiences, not just to our particular sites, but to London in general and see where the similarities and differences are. And that's run by a company called DJS. And what they do is analyze the surveys at a museum level, but also at a collective level so that we can really understand the trends that affect us all. And that's been super helpful both prior to COVID and obviously during COVID-19, everyone's been very open at sharing any of their audience data, um, any lessons learned. And I think that's really helped us um, create an, an opportunity for visitors to come back in a safe way across the sector really. That subject of data is really interesting and it's pretty rare in the mm. cultural space Base. Uh, so how, how do you do to, to convince uh, other cultural uh, places to, to work uh, um, with, uh, with you? Uh, is it a state of mind? I don't know, a London uh, state of mind? I don't know. How do you do? <laughs> so I think, um, I think with museums in particular, I've noticed it. I think other, so most London, so London National Museums are free of charge to enter. And I think that's a big difference. So whilst obviously we do, uh, we do need to have the fine, you know, we need to be financially secure. Uh, we aren't sort of for profit organizations. I think that's a big difference. So I think there's a real sense that actually we're peers, uh, we're all in this together and that's only heightened over COVID. So we're very open to sharing visitor data, insights, lessons learned with each other. And it's really feels like a community of practice. Um, and I think we've all seen the benefits of that. There's also a practical um, element to the exit survey where we realized if all, like if 10 different museums were separately procuring an exit survey, that's 10 lots of money, that's all the admin, and it actually made a lot of sense both financially and from an admin perspective for us to join forces and do one big procurement exercise together. And actually I would say that just the mere experience of going through that procurement exercise together meant that we all met up way more than we would before. And we had a kind of a, the collective aim, I suppose, a shared goal. And so it made sense for us to to share our data and knowledge um, in other ways. And we've really, yeah, we've we've become, I would say, a real community of practice that we feel we can speak to each other and ask questions, you know, what are you doing about your marketing campaign or um, your COVID restrictions? What's your capacity at the moment? What are you thinking about the latest government guidelines? And I think that's been really valuable and I hope will continue post the pandemic. And this state of, mind, uh, state of mind was the same before uh, the pandemic. It was not a, a thing, a new thing with uh, the pandemic, the COVID crisis. I would say it's not a new thing with the COVID crisis, but I think what COVID has done has really heightened it and increased it far beyond what it was before. Because before, um, well, I guess COVID, we, we had a shared, every museum, every visitor attraction is in the same boat. This, this crisis that affects us all that's new. So there was a real reason and a need to share findings because we didn't know how to reopen with two meter restrictions, for example, you know, what, what are we doing about interactive exhibits? And nobody knew. So it was a really, it gave us um, an impetus, I think, to really build on the connections we already had and extend those. And there's been some really great initiatives. For example, Rachel, Mac Rachel Mackay from the Historic Royal Palaces set up a recovery room website and blog and register where she was sharing um, for, um, findings initially from her MA research on how museums cope in a crisis and she built that into this series of blog posts that everyone could read to work out how to effectively bring back their front of house operations and that's now expanded into a recovery register where people can put their name forward and talk about their different areas of expertise, whether that is uh, retail and beverage, marketing, audience research. And we're saying, look, we're, we're, we've got knowledge in this field. We're happy to share. If you want to, if you're a smaller, more local museum, perhaps, 
um, and you want some advice, we're here, come and contact us and we'll have a conversation for you all, you know, free of charge. So there's been initiatives like that, that I've just seen proliferate during the COVID pandemic. Um, that's brought us all closer together and again I say I, I really hope this continues um, you know into the future. Cyril what do you think of this, uh, uh, of this share of data would you like to do the same with your museum? I'm quite open-minded like that I, I would like to to open the data with a lot of people but uh, in France we don't have this um, this culture indeed so we have a lot of um, meetings with other museums, with other directors, sharing our ideas, our budgets, or making a new project for exhibitions. Um, but uh, usually they are quite reluctant to share the, the, the name of their uh, patrons or, or the, 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 even the, the price of uh, an acquisition. They don't want even to say. Uh, I think it's. Uh, in Giverny, it's a mixed public uh, money and private money. So it's not a, a four little word, I mean, um, money. So you have to deal with that. And uh, the more you give, the more you receive. So I think when you open, it's, it's better than to be narrow minded. And it's a global project to open the museum to the society, to the nature, but also to open the, 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 the data. And for instance, I'm very reluctant to, to let the photograph be paid for a book or for a research, uh, a photograph for, for of our collection. I mean, it's, it's quite useless nowadays when you see what is happening in the USA with all the big museum uh, who are letting their photograph free for books. I think it's very crazy to be, to be narrow-minded with, to make maybe five or six euros a photograph to, to be let it be like that. I think it's, it's not, not very reasonable. But the open data is, is very important. And I think we will all go like that. But you'll take a lot of, of time. And the, the only uh, fence could be the education of the public. Because you give a number, you give a price, and it's a huge uh, polemic in the media because nobody can makes a, the balance between a budget and, and, and a, a price. So if you say you pay, I don't, don't know, you, you say you are um, uh, buying a, a painting by Bonnard, 300,000 euros, they say you're crazy. But uh, if you say that it was uh, 1 million three, three years before, uh, you say, oh, you make a good deal. So uh, you have to, to make an education of the public and it takes time. So you don't share that as that way, but you do work with uh, other museum, uh, with uh, Le Havre in, in Rouen as well, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So for you, the local collaboration is more um, on a regional scale. Yes, it is uh, every day. It is every day with uh, our colleagues from Normandie. Uh, I make um, this decision to, to, to let the museum enter um, a group of um, Normandy museums, like what we call the Fabrique de Patrimoine, that's a heritage uh, fabric, I don't know if I say that in English. Uh, it's a, a group of uh, museums sharing experiences on uh, collections, on exhibitions, on acquisitions. And uh, we have a lot of people in Giverny, maybe 200,000 people in six months, it's a lot. Uh, but um, I think we, we had to, to help also our colleagues so, for instance, we made an, uh, a partnership with uh, the Museum of Bayeux. Uh, they, 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 they lent a wonderful keyboard and we lent a wonderful signac in exchange. And it was the first time. And so it, they were quite happy. And the politics were very happy for that, saying that the museum both were working together uh, to the end of the, of the Normandy. And we have a, a new partnership with Guernsey. This is for Mary. Uh, we'll make uh, something, we'll make the village of Giverny become a, a friend village of Guernsey, and we'll make an exhibition on Renoir in Guernsey. So the exhibition will go to Guernsey and will go to, to, to Giverny, so, so that the Giverny goes to, to, the, to the seaside, and it's very important for us. Okay, and what role did technology play in designing common projects and maintaining uh, a relationship with all the uh, cultural places and local people? 
during the pandemic or before and now <laughs> every time <laughs> mary reply yes well technology has been fantastic hasn't it over the over the last year i mean for us i think we've really expanded um our online digital offer um quicker i suppose than we we perhaps would have done um already um so over the last year we've pivoted as many did to online events and we found that um it's been a really fantastic way of increasing our reach. So we used to run Nature Live um, events in the museum in our Attenborough studio, which is where members of the public could um, hear and contribute to a talk with a scientist and ask their own questions. Um, in the museum, I think capacity was probably about 60 people. Whereas online, you're reaching thousands, um, whether that's live or people catching it up, uh, catching up with it later. And we've definitely had um, uh, lots of positive comments and people saying, please continue with this, even when you go back to site, because I can't come to the museum, perhaps I'm too far away or I've got some kind of access uh, needs, etc. Um, so we've really expanded our events program. Um, we've been also piloting new platforms. So we've done some research into our youth market and um, uh, investigated what social media platforms um, sort of 18 to 24 year olds are on. And so we've just done a, an Instagram uh, live event recently, first time we've ever done that. Um, and so again, we're just gonna use this year as a bit of an experimental year to try new platforms, to see which audiences we reach, to do some evaluation on that, and then think about our plan going forward. We've also run virtual events such as, um, or virtual tours of exhibitions, for example, and things like that. So it's a real opportunity for us, I think, now to innovate, to learn, and then think about what elements we want to maintain in our offer going forward, even when visitors um, can come back on site. It's been, it's exciting in a way. It's one of the, I guess, positives perhaps of the, the pandemic. What about uh, an exhibition with uh, other museums? Uh, did you did you think about about that, about that? Well, we have a uh, we have some we have a touring uh, exhibitions team, and actually they've just opened a exhibition in Melbourne, Treasures of the Natural World, and that has been a massive challenge. Uh, trying to get our team into Australia, for example, um, has been a challenge. But we are still touring exhibitions as best we can during this time period. And we're also touring Dippy, our famous dinosaur. Um, so Dippy's been going on a tour of the UK, was due to open in Norwich uh, about a year ago, I think. And we're just about to open that exhibition um, finally uh, in the next month. So we are still trying to, to tour and to collaborate. Um, it's just that's a bit more challenging. <laughs> What about you, Cyril? Uh, did you test some tools, some solutions? Uh, what role uh, does technology play uh, in your museum? Our technology is very important, especially during the first lockdown. But uh, we noticed that in October, with the second lockdown, people were more uh, reluctant to uh, be in front of a computer and they wanted to have a new experiences. So we made a partnership with Google Arts and Culture for years and we made this week another uh, project with our current exhibition which is uh, called uh, Cote Jardin from Monet to Bonnard uh, with Google and we have uh, three aspects three, three views three insights of this exhibition in Google and uh, it's a new way to to have an experience and we'll make for instance next year a virtual exhibition about Kaibot me, we have uh, these wonderful daisies by Kaybot, and we'll make um, a project with young people, with a young designer from Rouen and the um, Le Havre School of Design, so that you can imagine um, a, a virtual uh, house of Kaybot where these daisies were painted. So it's important, but it will not replace the experience of a painting, a sculpture, a photograph in front of you in a room, in an exhibition. But it's, it's a way to, to, to catch uh, young people, um, because we have to say that people in museum, I think the same in Mary, maybe is that often they are very well-educated, uh, quite uh, wealthy, 
as they are used to to see the museums and uh, we, there's some some part of the visitor you are losing it's the teenagers you cannot see teenagers uh, in museums if you don't offer something new and the website uh, instagram stories twitter can be of course the a good ways to to good ways to to, to catch them so it's it's important for us and of course, we're making a um, new collaboration with Le Havre and Rouen. We're planning an exhibition for in 20, in, for the for the European Games in, in 24 uh, about um, photographs and in Normandy and impressionism. Um, we, so that we can have a, a kind of towering exhibition uh, in Normandy with Rouen and Le Havre, uh, so, so that we can have a pass, for instance, to go. Uh, from one museum to another one. So it's important to, to give also new projects and to be uh, uh, open to what the society expects. Just to, to quickly finish and uh, to open uh, the discussion, um, how do you see the future uh, of collaboration in the cultural spaces? Are you confident? Are you confident uh, for uh, um, the share of data, the, uh, I don't know, common exhibition, something like that? What, are, um, what is your feeling about that? Mary, maybe. I think it will only continue and, and get stronger, actually, because I think for firstly, COVID seems to be hanging around a lot longer than we were hoping. And so I think there's a lot that we still need to discuss as a collective. So around, for example, in Britain, a really live debate is if restrictions get lifted on the 19th of July, what do we do in cultural attractions? The ALVA, the Association of Leading Visitor Attractions in the UK, has done some public sentiment research that says that actually 75% of the UK public don't want restrictions to be eased in visitor attractions post that date. Um, so there's collective issues that are pertinent across the sector that we need to tackle together. Um, so I think certainly in the immediate short term, um, we will continue to do so. And I think the other thing is it's shown the value of that. We've established relationships now. We've established mechanisms of sharing knowledge and research. And I think we will build on that going forward. And I think we need to as well, because whilst we hope COVID will soon be a distant um, memory, there's going to be other crises uh, around the, cor the corner and it's going to take us a while to, to build back from this as well. So. I think it will continue. I think it has to continue. And I think people probably want to um, continue it. So um, yeah, fingers crossed, we will continue to, to share and collaborate going forward. Cyril, your feeling? It's the same as Marie as one. I think we really need to collaborate and to imagine uh, new ways to, to make projects, maybe less expensive, uh, less complicated to organize, it's very difficult to travel nowadays. I'm, I'm very impressive that you make a towering exhibition to Australia. It's really crazy. Um, for instance, we make a Monet Roscoe exhibition next year, next year. It will be four paintings by Roscoe, 10 Monets, and that's all. And I think it's impossible to make a big exhibition nowadays with uh, 200 species. You have to be more uh, ecological, uh, more responsible, and to offer something new. And maybe the, the future exhibition will be a mix between uh, numeric um, and a uh, piece of art inside uh, the same exhibition. And we have to think about it because if we don't do it, I think people will go away from the museum as they will go to Netflix. So uh, we have to change and uh, to be uh, um, more, more flexible on our schedule of exhibition. It's impossible to make something to say, I will do that in five or six years now maybe now we have one year to make an exhibition and for instance we consider three exhibitions last year and in, in, I imagine this exhibition uh, in six months so it's maybe a new process and uh, we need to be more collaborative between museums so maybe we'll make something with with Mary and and even it will have been very nice yeah let's uh, let's collaborate <laughs> Okay, I think we come to, to the end of this uh, round table. I think we have uh, five minutes of Q&A. If you have some uh, questions, you can, I don't know how, but you can maybe raise your hand, something like that. 
No, I don't have the discussion. Or maybe in the chat, um, in chat box, if you have questions, we are here for for you. <laughs> it was uh, crystal clear. <laughs> Yes, Julia, I've not seen any question in the discussion, so everything must be clear. Uh, I suggest that we move to, to the, the private room if there are some questions for a private discussion. Uh, do you agree with that? It was a question for me. Yes, uh, yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for everyone for being with us today. Uh, of course, this uh, conference is going to be shared uh, on our website and on YouTube. And you've got the information on your screen and how to join um, a private room if you have private questions to ask to our speakers.